a uh, special welcome to everyone joining us online. Uh, we are in our last week of the Gospel of John, which is crazy that this, this time has gone so, so fast. And so a few more announcements for us. Um, every week we take an offering. It helps us pay for tech and child care in the books. And so uh, your leader will pass around a little envelope. Thank you so much to all of those you who give. And there is no obligation. This is a free ministry. We're just happy that you're here. So thanks for your generosity. I want to put on your attention, in case you weren't here the past few weeks, uh, there's a few opportunities coming up for you to be aware of. The first one is CA is doing a serve day. So if you have a heart to serve the local community, uh, I want to invite you to mark this on your calendar, June 24th. Women's Ministry specifically has adopted Door of Hope as our site, but there's sites all around the city that you can go and give back to the community and volunteer for the day. So you can register for that online. Uh, it'll be from 9 to 3 p.m. on Saturday, June 24th. Uh, next event we have going on is we have men's conference this weekend. Uh, you are not invited to attend, but if you would like to serve, uh, we have a little service team. We're trying to support them the way they supported us at our conference, and there's a sign up in the back. Um, but beyond that, if you would just join me in praying for the men's conference, that God would meet with the men in our community and that he would speak a fresh word to them and that he encourage them and build them up. Um, we're just praying for the men to meet with Jesus that day. So if you want to volunteer, you can sign up in the back. Uh, and if you you can't volunteer or don't want to, that's fine too. But if you would pray uh, with us that the men would meet with Jesus and the yeah, lives would be changed uh, this weekend. Um, wanted to keep you aware, you guys have asked for more service opportunities, and so our staff has prayed, and we have delivered. And so we're starting something called a Women's Kingdom Effort, where we're going to have different events going on, hopefully monthly, uh, to give you an opportunity to serve in the local community and to plug into different organizations. So right now, Door of Hope is one of our adopted partners, and Hope Gardens is another one. Uh, and so starting in July, we're going to start serving with them monthly. And so we just created a web page. I want to encourage you to go check that out. Uh, if you want to give, donate a meal, if you want to um, serve in a different capacity, we're going to have different opportunities for you to be in consistent service in our community. So uh, that's coming up. The first meal will start. Yay. No, that's very exciting. Yes. <laughs> I agree. So July is the first meal that I think, I believe we're adopting at Door of Hope. So if that's something you have a heart for and you're like, yeah, I've been wondering when we're going to do something, please go on and sign up, um, sign up online for more info and we'll get you all the info of the dates and what we're looking for in meals. So awesome way to serve. And last but not least, uh, Summer in the Word that's coming up with us right now. Uh, we are going to do six small books. Uh, in the past, we've done Summer in the Psalms, Summer in Proverbs, uh, but our team was praying about it and we really felt like Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and First and Second Thessalonians were a great place for us to camp out for 50 days. So what this is, is you can sign up online. There's going to be a reading program that gives you a selected reading every single day. So all of us are in God's word together. Uh, some of you have said, what are we going to do when Bible study's done? We're doing Summer in the Word, people. So you can sign up for that online. Uh, next weekend, starting at church, the printed guides will be available. If you're someone like me, I like to bring it home and check it off each day just so I can know where I'm at with the study. Um, and we're also going to offer six-week groups. And so if you're a leader that wants to lead one, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that in a second. And if you're someone who's thought, you know, I've been here for a while. Like, I, I think I could lead a six-week group. This is an awesome opportunity to try uh, to do, try and feel out what leadership feels like uh, with a six-week summer group. And so um, right now, I'm actually going to ask you, we put out little cards uh, on your thing, and I waited till the end last night, and we missed a lot of people. Um, I don't want you to leave here without having a next step and a connection for whatever you need for us to follow up with. So if you would take a moment and grab that little form, there should be some on the tables. Um, it's really just for us to be able to communicate with you if you're interested in leading a group, if you're interested in serve day, if you want more information on the groups. Um, this is our way to follow up with you so that you, once you leave here, we don't lose you for the whole summer. So if you would take a moment and fill those out. Uh, and at the bottom, we ask what the Lord did in your life this year. Um, there have been some incredible stories of what God has done through the book of John. And it's not just through the teachings. It's not just in the worship. So much of what the Lord does happens in our group time of people praying for you, seeing answered prayers. Uh, we've heard of two healings um, that have happened, we, um, which is praise the Lord, which is amazing. And we want to celebrate what God is doing. And so if you've experienced a, a breakthrough in any way, an answered prayer, if God has moved anything in your heart, uh, I would love to be able to record that just so that our team can get, see some of the fruit of what God has produced this year. So if you want to take a moment, fill that out. You can also fill it out as I'm talking to you. But if you would just take a moment and think about what has the Lord done 
in your life through the book of John. And if you're online, um, all of our surveys are online and they were sent out to your leaders. So you can sign on online and fill out a little Google form and tell us, uh, because we want to know what has God done. Oh, the healings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There was a woman who was uh, living under depression for a long time, and the depression broke after over a year, and the joy of the Lord has filled her. And there was a woman who's been experiencing intense pain, intense pain in our community, who was prayed for last week and has had no trace of pain this entire last week. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And so we know, we know that God is at work, God is on the move, and we know that there's so many more stories that we haven't even heard. And so the fear is that we break from Bible study, you go out, and we don't even get to know or celebrate all the things that the Lord did. And so if you would take a minute and think through, what has the Lord done for you specifically? It could have been something small. It might have been meeting a new friend. It might have been you got over the, the fear of coming to Bible study for the first time. It might be that he spoke to you in his word when you were doing your daily quiet time. Uh, but as you're thinking about that, I don't want to miss the opportunity for us to give God glory. And so what I'm going to do is give you, I'm going to give you two minutes. I would love to have you turn to someone by you. Maybe it's someone in your table that you're going to talk about this later, but I know table time can go real fast when we have prayer requests. I want you to turn to a neighbor and tell them one thing that God did in your life through the book of John, whether you're here for one week or whether you're here for all 21. What's one thing that the Lord did in your life that you saw him do? Or if you didn't see him do anything, what's one thing you're hoping that he will do and you're still continuing to pray about. So you have two minutes. Ready? Go. Meet a new friend. All right. Will you join me in prayer? We could go on for a long time, but join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. We thank you for all that you have done, Lord. And we could, we could go on for days with the testimonies of the way we've seen you move, God. And I pray that we do. I pray that the conversation doesn't stop here. But Lord, we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts in each of our lives, Lord, the way that you have arranged the pieces, the way that you've revealed your truth, the way that you've come down and you've touched and you've healed, Father, the way that you've spoken a good word over us, Father, the way that you've removed shame from the past, Father, the way that you've invited us into a new season or a new start. Father, you are the God of new beginnings. And so we thank you, God. We thank you for each story accounted for here, each life accounted for here. Father, you are a God who is on the move and we love you and we worship you. And so Father, we invite you right now uh, to come and speak to us out of your word, God, as we gather for the last time this session uh, before summer hits, Father, would you, would you bring fresh revelation? Would you bring a fresh invitation? Uh, Would you bring a healing where we need healing? And would you bring hope where there is despair? And would you bring freedom where there feels like enslavement, Father? You know what each of us carries today, Father. And so we invite you to come and to have your way. And all God's people said, amen. Amen, Amen, friends. So we're diving into the last book of John, John 21, uh, which is just, it still blows my mind that we got through this whole session. And so the question I'm posing before us today uh, that we're gonna ask in five different ways, but I want you to ask yourself, How willing of a person are you? Think about that on a scale from one to 10. How willing are you? You see, God is a God uh, of choice. Our God does not demand obedience. He doesn't make us do anything. He doesn't force us to love somebody. He doesn't manipulate us to forgive somebody. Jesus Christ presents us with a beautiful choice and he asks us, are you willing? Are you willing? That's what it comes down to. Acts 17, 24 through 28 says this, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From the one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. God has created the whole world and everything in it that we might reach out for him that we might be willing to seek him, that we might make the effort to get to know him. Everything is on display for his glory and God leaves us with this beautiful choice. Are you willing? He doesn't make us do anything. 
That's the beauty of the faith. And so we're going to ask five questions today as we read this text. Are you willing? So let's dive in. We're going to start with John 2, uh, tw- sorry, John 21, 1 through 6. You can follow along on the side screens or in your books if you have them. Uh, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just as the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. First question I have for us today is, are you willing to cast your net again? Are you willing to cast your net? your net again. These fishermen, mind you, these are seven professional fishermen. This is their trade. They're not going out there for hobby. They're not going out there to kick it and get to know each other more or chat. They're going out with one goal in mind is to do their job and get fish to provide a living and to provide an income. So they didn't go out half-heartedly. They didn't go out unprepared or unexperienced. They went out on mission and they fish all night and they don't catch a single fish. And now there's commentaries believe that there's different reasons why they didn't catch fish. And what some of them believe, Luke 24, 29, Jesus commands the disciples, remain in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit falls on you, right? And here we see them at the sea, off fishing, going back to an old way of life. We don't have time. We don't have time to wait. There's nothing for us to do in Jerusalem. I'm going back to my own living. I'm going to start making my own money. I'm just going to get on with my life. This whole Jesus thing is over. I'm going back to me controlling what I can do. Others believe Matthew 28, Jesus says, meet me on the mountain. And they didn't go to the mountain and said they went right back to the sea. And that's why some scholars believe that they didn't catch a single fish all night. So they come in, you can imagine their distress, you know? They've been out all night. It's not really fun on a boat at night. I mean, during the day, it might be kind of beautiful. Maybe they're having good conversation. Maybe they get a good sunset or something. But at night, it's pitch dark. They're there for one reason, and that reason didn't happen. And I wonder if you and I, if we've ever done that. We've put our hands to the plow to make something happen, and nothing right? You know that feeling of discouragement, of frustration. So they're coming in, they're defeated, they're tired, they're worn. They probably feel like failures. This is their professional job, mind you. They weren't just amateurs at this. They were paid to catch fish and they couldn't catch one, all of them together. So they're coming in, they're defeated, and they see a man on the shore and he says, hey, did you get any fish? No. Embarrassing enough as it is. And this guy, who they don't know yet, it's Jesus. So we'll call him Joe, even though we know. Joe <laughs> is like, hey, you guys, what, try the other side. Can you imagine how you would feel? All night fishing, you're the pro. Some random Joe on the, f- on the seashore is like, hey, try the other side of the boat. Now, if you've ever been around fishing equipment, which I have been a few times, nets are very complicated. They take a long time to wind because you don't want them. It's kind of the livelihood. If the net breaks, it's kind of the whole point is done. So you have to be very careful with them, and they're very heavy. And so these men had brought in all their lines. They had put them perfectly. To cast out isn't as easy as just casting out a fishing pole. They had to undo all their work to dump it back into the ocean. And what did they do? They did. They listened to the man on the shore and they said, all right, we'll try the other side. And what happened? There was such a bounty that they could barely carry it in. I wonder how often you and I, when things don't go our way, when we try to make something happen and it doesn't work, we just kind of give up. We're like, all right, I've done that. I've tried that. I'm not praying that anymore. I've prayed that for three years. It didn't happen. I've been striving for 30 years for this thing that hasn't been accomplished yet. And we just want to give up. And Jesus says, cast your net on the other side. Where is the Lord inviting you to cast your net again? Are there unsaved people in your life? Is there a relationship that has hurt you that that God's asking for you to give it another chance for him to reconcile? Is there an area of your life where maybe you've squandered resources or assets or you've made a mistake that God says, I want you to go back there and I I want you to undo your mistake. I want you to ask for forgiveness. I want you to seek healing there. You see the difference between utter failure and shocking success 
was probably just the width of a boat, maybe, maybe four or five feet. And the disciples had to be willing to say, yes, I have tried this, but now I will try this in hopes that you can do something new. Where is the Lord inviting you to try again? Though failure might mark that area of your life with the Lord Jesus, nothing is impossible. And while it's easy for us to think, well, I tried everything. I'm just giving up in this area. I'm giving up on this person. I'm giving up on this friendship. I'm giving up on this job. Jesus doesn't ever give up on us. Even these seven disobedient disciples who are off fishing when he's asked them accordingly to be other places, Jesus doesn't abandon them and says, hey, why aren't you on the mountain? Or why, I see you, you're out of Jerusalem. He says, hey, did you catch any fish? Try the other side, I think you'll have luck. Where might God want to reap a harvest in your life that you've already decided, no, I can't. I can't trust him. I don't want to hope. I've tried that. It didn't work for me. Where is God inviting you to trust him to do something new? Where is the Lord asking you to cast your net and are you willing? Carrying on, John 21, 7 through 8. That disciple whom Jesus loved. I love that. If I ever write an autobiography, which I don't plan to, but if I ever do, I'm using that line. That one disciple that Jesus loved John's talking to himself. Therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. Can you imagine that? Like the light bulbs. Like they think it's a random guy. They go over, it's abundant, and they're like, it's Jesus. They've seen him twice now, mind you. So this is the third time they've seen Jesus since he's raised from the dead. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. Second question I have for us today. Are you willing to get out of the boat? Are you willing to get out of the boat? You see, back then, there was very different social norms. And so nowadays, we walk around with like midriffs and, you know, like our shorts cut off. But clothes was very proper back then. And you were always covered. And so you see this, that Peter took off his outer garment to work because he would stain these clothes and be dirty. And then he would put on a clean like outfit to see someone or to present himself in society because they had to present cleansly. They had to present covered. And so we see him fishing. He's in his work clothes. There might be some, well, there's not many fish guts because they didn't catch anything, but there's probably dirty clothes. And Peter recognizes that it's Jesus. And the first thing he does is he puts his outer garment back on, a sign of respect. Now, if I'm Peter and I see Jesus and I'm thinking that there's a plunge coming, I'm like taking everything. I'm like, I, I want to be free. I want to swim. But Peter, in respect, clothes himself in his modest and honoring attire and then flings himself in the sea. Reckless abandon. Now, while that might be normal or commonplace for us, that would have been very unprofessional, unreceived in society. If you've ever heard the parable of the lost son, when the father who's king runs towards his sons, kings don't run. They wait for people to come to them. Peter is in his, with his colleagues, with his coworkers, and is basically abandoning ship. He can't even contain himself. He's so excited to see Jesus that he puts on his proper clothing, which he's going to eventually have to see people in town, doesn't care, throws himself into the sea, gives up pride, gives up social status, doesn't care what other people think. Where is God asking you to get out of the boat of your own comfort zone, of your own appearance, of your own social standing, of your own reputation? Where is God asking you, don't care about what other people think, just fling yourself at me, come to me, run to me. So many of you I know work in secular workplaces where it's not cool to be a Christian. It's not even something that is, in some situations, even tolerable or imaginable. Where is God asking you in your own life? Maybe it's within your own family. Maybe it's within a friend group. Maybe it's in, maybe it's in your community or your neighborhood where you maybe are ostracized for being a Christian. Where is God asking you, hey, I need you to be willing to follow me even to that place, to show that you love me even if it causes you social disruption, even if it causes others to look down on you, even if it causes your reputation to be broken and for you to break social norms to show that you love me, where is God asking you to get out of your comfort zone for his name's sake? You see, so often you and I can make comfort such a God. We can make ourselves such princesses where I don't, I don't want anyone to think bad of me. I don't want anyone to think that I'm, you know, judgy like those other Christians. I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm a Christian. I'm not going to share Jesus. I'm just going to, you know, go along with the flow. Jesus says, are you willing to get out of the boat with reckless abandon to be close with me, to be near to me? 
that's an invitation he gives all of us today. Have you counted the cost of being with Jesus? You see, Peter, Peter had counted the cost. And Peter, if you remember, is the one that had walked on water to Jesus before. And so I wondered, as I was reading this book, I was reading and I was thinking, I wonder if Peter thought when he flung himself out to the sea, if he was going to walk. You know, I was like, Jesus, I know you. And he starts running and then he like sings and he's like, oh, I shouldn't put on the outer garment. But I wonder what he went through Peter's mind, but there was no fear. Nothing held him back. He didn't abstain and then hold to the social norms. He said, I don't care what it takes. I'm breaking culture. I'm breaking status. I'm looking, I'm going to look like a fool in front of my friends. I'm going to be sopping wet on this sea, but I will do anything to get to Jesus. Where's Jesus inviting you to get out of the boat? John 21, 9 says this. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. My third question for us today is, are you willing to make time for Jesus? Are you willing to make time for Jesus? You see, here are the disciples. They were out all night. If any of you have ever been up all night or worked the night shift, it's not fun and it's not easy to not be exhausted in the morning. They've also failed in their own power. They tried very hard to catch fish and didn't. And now they're coming in and Jesus says, come, I've served, I've created breakfast for you. Who wants to miss that, right? Who wants to miss fresh fish on the sea with Jesus? And that's the thing though, Jesus prepares a fresh meal for you and I every single day. The second we wake up, he is there waiting to meet with us. John Mark Comer said about, he, he said, Jesus waits to be wanted. Every single day, Jesus has fresh manna for you. And he sits and he waits and he hopes, oh man, I hope, I hope Coley makes time for me today. I hope, she, I hope she gets in the word. I hope she prays. I have so much I want to tell her. I have so much I want to give her. I've prepared this whole meal for her. I've started a fire. Jesus waits to be wanted. Are you willing to give him your time. Time is one of our most valuable resources. It's something that, and especially in our society and the busyness and chaoticness, it's something that seems like there's never enough. And yet God allows, anoints each of us with the exact same amount of time. And he says, I am the author of time. When you give your time to me, I multiply it. When you hoard it to yourself and you say, I'm too busy for you, God, I can't do this. We end up going astray making decisions on our own, trying to live out of our own power, trying to catch fish where there's none to be caught. Jesus says, I want your time. I want you to sit with me. I want you to have breakfast with me. I want to bless you. I want to fill your cup. I want to provide for you. I want to give you warmth around the fire. I want to be with you. Have you given Jesus the opportunity to be with you on a daily basis? That's all he asks for. He wants your heart. He wants to sit with you. He wants to bless you and fill your cup in ways that you can't fill it apart from him. But it gets hard, right? The enemy is a sneaky, sneaky liar, and he tells us that we have no time, that we're much too busy, that we have way too many things and responsibilities and people, and if if God only knew my schedule, he would understand. God does know your schedule. God is the author of time. Are you willing to make time for Jesus? He wants to feed you. He wants to give you life. He wants to give you everything that you cannot provide for yourself, on your own. And yet the lie of the world is I gotta figure it all out first. And when everything's set, then I'll make time for Jesus. What would it look like for you to carve out time for him every single day? Read the word, meditate, study, sing a hymn, praise him, sit in silence and just listen. Go for a walk in nature and just recognize the beauty he created specifically for your eyes. Jesus is asking for our time. And when we give it to him, we are blessed and our cup is full. John 21, 15 through 19, going on, it says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Peter was grieved because he had said it to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this to him, he said, follow me. Fourth question for us today is, are you willing to follow Jesus' way and not your way? Are you willing to follow Jesus' way and not your way? You see, Jesus is asking him, he's asking him again and again, do you love me? And Peter's getting grieved because he's like, oh man, there's something in him being triggered from when he denied Jesus three times, right? Of like, oh, I, got, I didn't prove myself last time. Why are you asking me a third time? And every time Jesus is responding, feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus is reminding him, this is about my sheep, not your sheep. This is about what I've called you to do, not what you think you want to do. Jesus was telling him the, t- the type of death that he was going to experience. It says, when you were young, you dressed yourself, or you went wherever you want, you did whatever you want. No longer so for those who follow me. When we follow Jesus, we don't go wherever we want and do whatever we want. We ask the Lord, what do you have for me? What's the purpose you give my life? What sheep have you given me to tend to? You know, a lot of us can look around our lives and be in, in like, feel like we got a lot of hard people to love, right? A lot of, maybe some annoying people, maybe some people that get on your nerves a little bit, maybe people that are like, that's all work for somebody else. And Jesus says, <laughs> those are my sheep. There's not a single person in your life that was not assigned to you, that God didn't ordain to be a part of your life, family included. It's kind of crazy, I know. <laughs> but God has placed you exactly where he has because those are the sheep that he has asked you to tend to, the flock he has asked you to feed. There is not a single person in here that does not have a literal ministry with the people around you and in your life that live on your street, that you work with, that are your family, that are your extended relatives. Yep, all the crazies. Those are exactly who God has placed you to love. No longer is it who do, who's fun to be around, who's easy to be with, who do you, where do you want to go? You want to go out every week? You want to travel every week? Okay, do whatever you want. Jesus says, when you follow me, if you, if, if you love me, you will tend to the people that I give you. You will care for the people that I died for. You will see them as my sheep and thus your sheep. Who are the sheep that God is asking you to tend to? And friends, it's not always easy, Right? I can, I'm sure you can think of one, maybe two people in your life that are a little bit harder to love than maybe the average, the average Joe. And God says, those are the people I'm calling you to. That's why I've placed you in their life. Will you go my way or will you go your way? Again, Jesus does not ever make us do anything. He says, if you love me, you will be willing to serve the people that I've put in your path. If you don't love me, you have every freedom that I give you to go do whatever you want, to to ignore people, to serve yourself, to love your own life more than theirs. But if you love me, this is my requirement of you, that you will love the sheep that I have put around you. Who is God inviting you to love today? Who is God inviting you to forgive today? Who is God asking you to be patient with even if they don't deserve patience, to be loving with, even though maybe they don't deserve your love, to be forgiving with, even though they've hurt you many times. This is the cost of following Jesus. Jesus says you can go your way or you can go my way, but if you love me, I want you to take care of the people in your life that I've given you. Who is God asking you to feed today and are you willing or will you go your own way? The last passage is John 20, 20 through 24. Peter turned and saw the disciples whom Jesus loved following them, the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that's going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about that man? (laughs) Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is it to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that the disciple was not to die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but if it's my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Last point for us today is, are you willing to fix your eyes on Jesus alone and not compare yourself with another? Are you willing to fix your eyes on Jesus alone and not compare yourself with another? I think if we're honest, I think this can be one of the most challenging parts of the passage for women. I think there can be something in us uh, that, I don't know, by nature feels comparative. And so here's Peter. Jesus is laying out how he's going to die. And Peter looks over and sees John, the one who the disciple loves. And he says, well, what about him? How's he going to die? What's, only, I'm, only I'm getting punished? My will, your will for me is for me to die? And John, John gets off scot-free? Peter, if you know anything about his death, Peter, Peter was crucified and he asked to be crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to be crucified in the same way as the Lord Jesus. But John, John's story is a little less known. John uh, was basically sentenced to be burned to death in boiling oil by Nero, who was persecuting Christians. And so he was thrown into a cauldron of boiling oil and because of God's grace, he did not die. But he barely survived. So he had burns head to toe, was covered in oil, and then he was sent to Patmos, which was a prisoner's island where he was forced to do slave labor. They were forced to manually mine, mine the grounds there. So you can imagine with burn skin and the coal dust and mining, that was John's sentence. And the point about this is, is that so often it can be easy to look at someone else's life and think that they have it easier than you. It's easy to look at somebody and say, man, why, she doesn't have to go through anything I go through. Why isn't she suffering like that? Why didn't she lose a loved one like I did? Why are her, why are her kids acting perfect? Why did she get married? Why is her husband treated like that? Why did she have that job? Why does, it can be easy to start comparing ourselves to others and stacking the deck and feeling like Peter, of like, what, how, why is she so blessed? Why is her life so much easier? Than, why, does, why does everything come easy for her? And God said, what is it to you if he remains or goes? Here's the reality. All of us in life are given an assignment and we're equipped for that assignment. We're given what we need, when we need it, how we need it. All of us, every single person in this world goes through trials, goes through tribulations, suffers and struggles in some way. And no, they are not the same way because we are different people. And God has portioned each one of us exactly what we need. So the problem is when you and I look on another woman's page and say, why didn't I get that? We don't know her story. We don't know her past. We don't know her future. Her future. We only see one little part. And what happens is when we don't address that, bitterness and envy can bury deep inside of us. And what that births in us at times is judgment and hatred and condemnation and justification and righteousness that God never intended. You see, each person is allotted what they need to do their mission, and everyone's mission looks differently. There is no person in here that has the same assignment as you. There's no person in here that has the same calling as you, and so your chips will always look different than somebody else's. God says in the Bible, to whom much is given, much will be expected. So when you look at the woman, or a man too, but I'm going to use women for today. When you look at the woman, you think, man, her life is so perfect. Everything so, seems so easy for her. Why is it, why does she get all that? We have no idea the call and the assignment that that's on that woman's life. We have no idea what the Lord will ask her to suffer, to sacrifice, or what she maybe currently is suffering that you have no idea about what's going on behind the scenes. You see, we see in such a small part and God sees the whole picture. And so I wonder if today, who do you need to stop comparing your life to? Whose page do you keep looking over and feeling so disappointed that this was the lot gave you when God gave her this? We have no idea what assignment is on that woman's life. All we can do is take what the Lord has given us and be faithful to it and to trust him and to know that my assignment, I have everything I need for my assignment and the race that I am called to run will not look like any other race in all history of mankind. The things the Lord will ask me to suffer, to sacrifice, to trust him in, to walk on water with will not be what your story looks like and that's the beauty. Every story is different. Every story experiences seasons of goodness and seasons of hardships. We all find mountaintops, we all find valleys. And so it's not, it doesn't do anyone any good when we sit in our valley and say, 
this is the worst. God, you are unjust. She has a mountain and I have a valley. God says, I am making all things new in my time. And you won't be in the valley forever and she won't be on the mountain forever. Where does the Lord need to set you free from comparison? Because friends, it is a trap that the enemy will use to ensnare a life and a heart and a mind real quick. And if you've ever been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Envy is one of the, I think, hardest human emotions because you feel so entitled to something that we wonder is, where does that entitlement come from? Why don't I have this? Why am I suffering this way? Jesus says, every person has their own assignment and I will give them exactly what they need. So when you see, when you're tempted to compare yourself to someone else, I wanna encourage you to ask the Lord to show you specifically how he designed you and what your call is. Because we can never fully know someone else's story. We only see in part. We don't know in full. What looks perfect, I can almost guarantee you is not. If you have anyone in your life that you know that you've thought their life is perfect, you will know that the closer you get to them, the more you will uncover pain and trial and hardships. And what happens in our society is we so often try to project an image that everything's okay. And those who sometimes suffer the most have become the best at projecting the best image. We don't know anyone else's stories. All we know is that God is good and he is faithful to us in our situation, in our calling, in our position in life. And he will give us everything we need to go to move forward into his glory and into his plans. So where do you need to fix your eyes on Jesus today? The question Jesus asks us, basically why John the apostle wrote the entire gospel was for us to know that Jesus presents us this opportunity. Jesus calls to each of us and he says, follow me. And the question we have to decide in our hearts is are we willing? Are we willing to follow Jesus to the ends of the earth to the sheep next door that maybe smells, to get out of the boat that feels uncomfortable, to cast our net yet again when we've tried a thousand times and it didn't work, and to fix our eyes on him alone and not what we see as competition or envy around us of what others might have. Where is Jesus today inviting you specifically? Follow me, forsake all else. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we come to the close of your gospel, Lord, we praise you for the truth that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and was resurrected and offers eternal life to all who will believe in him, Father. And so we we praise you for the gift that we get to know you, Jesus, that we get to, to do life with you, that we get to receive you in our heart. And Lord, all of our journeys look different. And so right now, Father, I pray for each woman in this room Father, her followership is of utmost importance to you, Father. And so I pray uh, in this next minute, God, would you minister to each woman that's in this room, Father? Would you show each woman specifically what does it look like for her today to follow you? Maybe you're asking her to cast the net again. Maybe you're asking her to get out of the boat. Maybe it's a time thing where you're asking her to make time for you. Maybe it's, it's asking her to abandon or forsake her way for your way. And God, maybe it's, it's to trust you. Maybe it's to get out of our own comfort zone and allow you to be the lone, only God. And maybe it's giving up a comparison that we've made. Father, whatever it is, uh, we give you the next 30 seconds, Lord. Would you reveal if there's anything in us that we can't see? What does it look like for us to follow you right now in this place that we are today? Lord Jesus, I thank you for the women that are in this room, God. I bless them with a love deeper than any of us can ever know through Jesus Christ, Father. I pray you'd fill each woman's cup today, Father. And I bless their time in their groups, Lord. Groups are sacred and holy spaces where we get to come undone and we get to be known and we get to listen and encourage one another, Father. So I pray a covering over each group's closing time, Lord, that each woman would feel uplifted and seen and known and 
able to follow you, God, to whatever assignment you're calling her to. So I bless each woman today here in the name of Jesus. And we thank you for your son. We thank you for the gospel of, the gospel of John that tells the good story of Jesus. May we live fully surrendered to the gospel that you died to give us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.